My name is Sharon Reed Williams. I am a wife, I'm a mother, I'm a daughter, I'm a sister, I'm a niece. For 26 of my 51 years, I've been a lawyer. And if you're one of my friends, I hope you consider me family. In these very challenging times that we're dealing with, I felt compelled to use my voice and my privilege to try to give some context to the rage and the fury that we see on the news and read about in the papers. I, like many African Americans in my generation, stand on the shoulders of many people who sacrificed so much for me to enjoy the relative comfort that I enjoy. What I am hoping to accomplish is to add to this conversation in a meaningful way by using the lived experiences of my grandfathers, Clarence Cortez Reed and Willie B. Taylor. All four of my grandparents were born in Georgia between 1911 and 1922. I often wonder if the calm or the draw that I have felt to the red Georgia clay is because of those roots and how far they go back. The Georgia they knew, however, in the early 1900s was a very different place than the one I chose to live in nearly 100 years later after graduating from law school in 1994. But even after African Americans began to be a part of the political process, the state legislatures of the South passed more and more and more restrictive measures which were effectively designed to criminalize black life, to make it essentially impossible for any African American man who didn't live under the explicit protection of some white landowner uh, to not be in violation of some law at almost all times. It was a crime in the South for a farm worker to walk beside a railroad. It was a crime in the South uh, to uh, to speak loudly in the company of white women. Uh, it was a crime to sell the products of your farm after dark, almost anywhere in the South. Uh, there were reasons, there were sort of odd logics behind almost all, of these, uh, almost all of these laws, and none of them said that they applied exclusively to African Americans. But overwhelmingly, they were only ever enforced against African Americans because the explicit intent, and, and I, when I say the intent was explicit, uh, it was. Uh, in the Constitutional Convention of Alabama in 1901, when uh, the, the, a new constitution was passed, which effectively ended all black participation in political life and public life in Alabama, the discussions around the drafting of these laws were very open about the intention of to make it impossible for black men to participate uh, in mainstream American life in any meaningful way. Stanley Reed was my father. Clarence Cortez Reed and Catherine Moody Reed were my paternal grandparents. It is from them that my bloodlines of freedmen and a long history of land ownership and the privilege of formal education. That's where I get it. My granddad Reed graduated from Morris Brown University in 1929. For those that don't know, Morris Brown was founded in 1881 by the AME Church, which is the African Methodist Episcopal Church. And it was the only institution of higher learning in the state of Georgia founded by and for African Americans. Jessie Taylor Reed is my mother. Willie B. and Ida Mae Taylor were my maternal grandparents. From their bloodlines come the roots of sharecroppers, 
and landowners. My granddaddy and my big mama, as all of their good grandchildren refer to them, were born, they met, they married, and they had two of their seven children while living on Bell Plantation Farms in Miami, Georgia, which is a small um, rail st railroad stop town about three hours or three or four hours south of Atlanta. And although I have been to the homesteads and the plantations where all of my grandparents were born, I struggle to understand what their lives were like because they never placed upon me the burden of the pain of their childhoods. And although I intellectually understand that they grew up in the Jim Crow South, I truly struggle to understand the hate that some would have because of the color of their skin, because these were people who held me as a baby, who held my hands when I learned to walk, and who nurtured me their entire lives. The term Jim Crow typically refers to repressive laws and customs once used to restrict black rights, but the origin of the name itself actually dates back to before the Civil War. In the early 1830s, the white actor Thomas Dartmouth Daddy Rice was propelled to stardom for performing minstrel routines as the fictional Jim Crow, a caricature of a clumsy, dim-witted black slave. Rice claimed to have first created the character after witnessing an elderly black man singing a tune called Jump Jim Crow in Louisville, Kentucky. He later appropriated the Jim Crow persona into a minstrel act where he donned blackface and performed jokes and songs in a stereotypical slave dialect. Rice's act proved a massive hit among the white audience and he later took it on tour around the United States and Great Britain. As the show's popularity spread, Jim Crow became a widely used derogatory term for blacks. Jim Crow's popularity as a fictional character eventually died out, but in the late 19th century, the phrase found new life as a blanket term for a wave of anti-black laws laid down after Reconstruction. Some of the most common laws included restrictions on voting rights. Many Southern states required literacy tests or limited suffrage to those who, whose grandfathers had also had the right to vote bans on interracial relationships, and clauses that allow businesses to separate their black and white clientele. The segregationist philosophy of separate but equal was later upheld in the famous 1896 Supreme Court decision, Plessy versus Ferguson, in which the court ruled that the state of Louisiana had the right to require different railroad cars for blacks and whites. The Plessy decision would eventually lead to widespread adoption of segregated restaurants, public bathrooms, water fountains, and other facilities. Separate but equal was eventually overturned in the 1954 Supreme Court case Brown v. Board of Education, but Jim Crow's legacy would continue to endure in some southern states until the 1970s. All of my grandparents would eventually migrate north as part of the great migration from the south, which was a mass exodus of black people from the south to the north for greater opportunities. Black Southerners who left the south in 1916 and the years following the beginning of what we often call the great migration, left the south really to fulfill the aspirations of full citizenship that their grandparents had thought about upon emancipation. Uh, they went for better jobs, they went for higher wages, but they also went to educate their children. They also went because they could vote. Uh, as one man explained in a letter, uh, they went to a place where a man could be a man. For women, uh, being able to be a woman with self-respect meant being able to walk into a store 
try on whatever you want. Uh, it meant being able to walk down the street without feeling that white men were looking at you in ways that you didn't want them to look at you. Uh, it's not that the North was some place that didn't have racism. There was plenty of racism in the North. Uh, in 1919 in Chicago there would be a riot. In many other cities there was violence. But it meant that you felt a certain amount of self-respect. My granddad Reed, when he graduated from Morris Brown, was promised a engineering apprenticeship at a automotive factory in Akron, Ohio. When he got there, they realized that he was a black man. And instead of offering and honoring the apprenticeship that he had traveled so far to get, they told him that all he could be was a janitor. My granddad Reed died when I was only 10 years old, but he passed to my father who passed to me an unwavering commitment to education because he understood the value of it, although the promise had not been kept for him. Willie B. Taylor, or my granddaddy, was in my life much longer. Um, he actually passed away two weeks before my final exams during my first year of law school. I recall wanting to attend his funeral and my mother saying to me that he would not want me to interrupt my education to come to a funeral, even if it was his. I recall asking him um, when I was in high school, I was doing a project for a, some sort of history family tree kind of project. And I asked him very naively why, of all of the northern cities he could have chosen, did he choose Akron? Now, in hindsight, I realize how just um, clueless I was in that moment and how far removed I was from what his life was like in the Jim Crow South to think that he had a choice, that it was a cavalier decision. Do I go to Chicago? Do I go to Flint? Do I go to Cleveland? When in reality, I'm sure it was not that easy. And in his trademark calm manner, what he said to me was, grandbaby, all I knew is that I could no longer be a sharecropper because it was no different than slavery. I didn't care where it was I went. As I have gotten older, I have tried to put his life, the parts of it that I didn't get to live with him, in perspective. He was a World War II veteran and he was a Korea, Korean War veteran and he was awarded the a Medal of Commendation by the Marine Corps for sustained acts of heroism during the war. And he, it, it, I came across, it, it, probably in the last, I'd say, year or so, his journal that he kept during World War II. And on the front page of the journal, it was in some of my mom's things I was clearing out for her, he, he has, he has his, his name, the fact that he's a corporal and how he can receive letters. And he talks about being in Belgium and he talks about being in France. And as I was reading it, all I could think was one, how proud he had been even by the time I came along, obviously many years later, to have served in the wars. But also how proud he was to be an American. And at the time, I didn't understand why he was so proud because he served in segregated units. So he never got to realize the promise that he was fighting to achieve. You would think that people like my grandfather, who served so valiantly, would benefit from the GI Bill, which was enacted to help uh, veterans of World War II assimilate to civilian life in America. And it was to give them um, 
preferential treatment in mortgage rates so that they could buy homes to help them get money to go back to college so that they could finish school or to help them go to trade schools so that they could find a way to make a living outside of being servicemen. The government of the United States began to prepare for the returning servicemen with the passage of the GI Bill of Rights. The Screen Magazine attempted to explain the general principles of the bill, how an ex-soldier or sailor would be given money to continue his education, how a returning serviceman who was starting his own business would get a financial boost from the government, how money would be advanced to buy property or a home, how employment bureaus and trade schools were established for men who wanted to learn new skills. Americans were determined that this time, the men who fought for their country would find a place in it when they returned. A reporter for The New Yorker in November 1996 wrote an article that entitled The Tragic Forgotten History of Black Military Veterans. And he said, while the GI Bill did not specifically exclude African-American veterans from its benefits, it was structured in a way that ultimately shut the doors for 1.2 million black veterans who served bravely and proudly during World War II and in segregated units. My grandfather was one of those men who was excluded. As he was older and he had to leave the home that he had bought, he and my grandmother had bought in Akron, Ohio, his children and grandchildren got involved in his finances and we came to understand that not only did he not benefit from the GI Bill, but that the interest rate on the mortgage for the home that he bought was in excess of 20%. So it is on this history and those shoulders that I stand and I, and, and I, I understand to the core of my soul, my responsibility to make good of their sacrifices and to use my platform, however small, however brief, to try to help those who wish to understand why what you see in the streets is so filled with rage and so filled with fury because it is hard to be calm when those that you love have been hurt. So, you know, George Floyd's death has brought awakening and a reckoning for some in America. But for me, it's really just a, another chalk mark on the, on the blackboard that I have in my head of the examples of a promise unfulfilled where justice and freedom and liberty for all have not been the promise kept for African-Americans. In the last couple of weeks and months, some of my very dear white friends have reached out to me with calls and with emails and with texts and, they've, and they want me to know how much they care. And I am touched, I really am, by the fact that they care so much. But what I know and what I live is the experience of loving a black man. My husband is a tall, strong, quick-witted, dark-skinned, beautiful black man that many would see as a threat. I have brothers, I have cousins, I have uncles who many would see as a threat. And I don't worry about my husband when he leaves to go to work in his work attire. It's not when I worry about him. When I worry about him is at night if he happens to go to the store for me or on the weekend when he isn't in safe attire. I worry about my brothers if they have to make a quick trip to Lowe's in the middle of the night and all I wish for is for them to come home safely. So when you see people standing in the streets screaming and full of rage, yes, it is about the George Floyds and it's about the Clarence Reeves and it's about the Willie B. Taylors, but it's also about so many other people whose names you will not know, whose names you would not recognize, whose lives 
will, you would have you will never have interacted with but their families and their friends remember them we understand what has been stolen what has been taken and what has been wrecked by systematic racism so when my friends my very dear white friends ask me what they can do here's what i ask of you i want you to have the very hard conversations with your white friends and your white family members and ask them to join you in the challenge of loving me and my